be with you this morning. And we had a, a good day together. It's, it's just great when Christians can come together for something other than worship, not to, not to diminish worship in any way, but it is great when we spend time together doing other things. And I, for one, was greatly encouraged by the number of people that came out yesterday. And I thank you for doing that. And I know others would have if they felt that they could have. Uh, some physically, some otherwise occupied, and various other things, and we appreciate your prayers and encouragement as well. This passage that we have just read from the epistle, from the uh, Gospel of Mark, uh, it, uh, is that in which Jesus speaks of the first commandment and the second commandment. And uh, my plan is this morning to deal with the first, and this evening, if the Lord wills, to deal with the second <clears throat> Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Christians ought to be living each and every day aware of the command to love God with all of our being. Amen. Do you do that? That's hard to do. I don't know that there's ever been a society in which across the board everybody was uh, accurately keeping that. I mean, the Old Testament prophets and even Moses, while he still lived, encouraged the people to rethink their motivations for living. And the apostles, when they wrote to the churches, reminded them continually to put away their sins, their shortcomings, their, their failures, their false doctrines and false practices, and to put God first in their lives. The first of all the commandments, what was that, the scribe asked, and the Lord gave his answer. Some have suggested, and I think with good reason, that what Jesus has given here in these two questions is a summary of the Ten Commandments. The first question, or the first great commandment, being a summary of the first four. Uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And the others then of uh, the last part, or how people relate to one another in the last six of the Ten Commandments. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew's record of this conversation, Jesus says this is the first and great commandment. I don't know that we can understand all that Jesus might have had in mind when he added that word great, but we can understand some aspects in which the commandment to love God is great. In the first place, the commandment is great because <clears throat> God is the highest one who can be loved. God's greatness makes him worthy of our greatest love. What's so great about God? Well, in the first place, he's eternal. In the second place, of course, he sees and knows everything. God is the one who is able to that is qualified to give us commandment. He knows how we ought to live. He knows what is the successful way to live in this world because he created this life and this world. He created the world as a suitable place for man to live, the man whom he knew he was going to create. And thus he created man and put him into this world. God surely knows why he created the world the way he did, why he created man the way he did, and he knows what's the best way to live here. God is great because he sees all, he knows all, he's watching over everything that we do. Uh, parents would love to be able sometimes to have that ability to know where their children are at all times, to know what they're doing, to know that they're safe, to know that they're uh, following a pathway that leads uh, in the, the right way uh, that uh, will lead them into uh, safety in this world, but better than that, to uh, lead them into an eternity with God the Father. We can't see all of that. We can't know all of that. We certainly can't govern all of that. 
But God sees and God knows and God has legislated. He has given us the path in which we should walk <clears throat> that will lead us to him and to his uh, great uh, uh, approval and his blessing of us. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 19, our brother wrote to us, we love him because he first loved us. And some translations leave out the him. We love because he first loved us. Well, either way, that's true. We learn love from God, for God is love. We wouldn't know what love is if God hadn't created us the way he did and if he were not who he is. We love God first. We put him first in our love because he is the highest one who can be loved. But secondly, because love for God is the basis of the truth of the gospel which saves many souls. Jesus is the divine proof of the love that God has for us. Who doesn't know? John 3 and verse 16, among those who know anything about the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, and you can find it recorded in John chapter 15 and verse number 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life <coughs> for his friends. God displayed his love by giving us Jesus and then demonstrated his love in Jesus. You remember in John chapter 14, near the end of his life, when the apostle said, Thomas said, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And he said, have I been so long a time with you and yet have you not known the Father? And I believe that was Philip, not Thomas. But uh, anyway, the apostles but Jesus, if we look at him, we're seeing God. And we're seeing the tremendous love that God has for us uh, in the way that Jesus worked, the uh, feeding of the, of, of the hungry, uh, the healing of the, the injured and the ill, the suffering in various ways. And uh, then, of course, in his teaching about our love for God, our love for one another, and demonstrating, uh, and, and how we ought to demonstrate or give evidence of that love. So what evidence is there that we love him in return? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more, Lord willing, uh, this evening in our uh, lesson as we assemble together. But remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Love is demonstrated in behavior Amen. and in words and in the attitudes, the body language, the facial expressions, and various other kinds of things. If people can't sometimes maybe see your love in all of that, they can very often see your lack of it. What evidence is there that we love God? If the evidence is not there and visible to others that we love God, then what evidence is there that we have faith in God? That we believe the truth of God? People will look sometimes at Christians and say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't want any part of it. If, if you're an example of that church, a representative of that church, then I don't want to be a part of that church. I don't see any love. I don't see any faith. I'm not sure that you even believe what you preach because of the evidence that I see in your life. That evidence is because we put God first in our life. If we love him, we're going to be like him. We're certainly going to do those things which please him. In the third place, love for God is great because love for God expresses man's highest ideals in life. What is it that makes human beings uh, 
the top rung of the ladder of life on earth. What is it about man? The psalmist wrote in the 73rd Psalm, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verses 25 and 26. The Apostle Paul is an example of man's great love for God and the capacity of love to elevate man to his highest ideals. Look at Saul of Tarsus, a murderer of God's chosen people, God's children. A, a, a man breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the people of God. And this one became a preacher of righteousness because he loved God. Late in his life, Paul said, I have lived before God in all good conscience unto this day. He loved God when he was persecuting the church. He just didn't understand what he ought to do because he loved God. There are many people today who love God, who haven't paid attention to his word and have not understood, or some have understood and not have uh, cared to obey it, of course, they don't love God like they say they do. But there are people who love God and try to do right. They just haven't learned how to do what's right. When Saul learned how to do what's right in the eyes of God, then he converted from the murderer to the evangelist, the apostle of Jesus. He wrote to the church in Rome in chapter 8 and verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. All people are called by the gospel of Jesus Christ, but some don't love God enough to care. Some don't love God enough to obey what he says, to come to him on his terms. But if we are called according to his purpose, that is, is if we are the called, we are the people who have been called and now are following after his purpose because we love him, all things work together for good. Now, preachers and commentators disagree on exactly what might be included in that particular statement, but it's a statement of truth. Some say, well, it's all, all things that God wants done. Some try to, try, try to encourage us by, by saying that everything that happens to you in life is going to be good. Well, we know that's not true. Some would modify that and say, well, uh, all things, whatever happens to you, good or bad, is ultimately going to work out for the good. And I suspect that there's a great deal of truth in that. But in any case, we know that whatever God wants done is going to be done. God, is, God created this world. He created man, put man in the world, and he's going to end this world someday and bring man into account before him. And so the apostle writes in Galatians chapter 6, the 14th verse, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul no longer followed after the ways of the world. As a song that we sang a while ago, those things that it, once in which I gloried uh, now have no value to me because I have put God first. And then I'm comforted by the words of Paul to the church in Corinth in the first letter in the eighth chapter in the third verse. If any man love God, the same is known of him. You can be sure that God knows those who love him. God is aware. He knows your every thought. He knows your every, every attitude of your heart. He knows your mind. He knows your strength and all of the things that uh, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy and Jesus quoted before that scribe. God knows how much you love him or how little, if that might be the case in your life. 
Nothing but the love of God could have made Paul the bold Christian that he was, and nothing but the love of God can make you what you can be in this world. If you put God first and love for him first above all other things, then everything else is going to fall in place. If you get the framework right, all the pieces will fit. Do you ever work a jigsaw puzzle? Don't you start with all the edge pieces? Most folks do. When you get all the edge pieces in and you've got all the framework there, then you know that all the other pieces have to fit in there somewhere. And it might take time to get them all to come together right. And it might take a lot of effort. But if you put God first, then everything else will eventually come together in your life. And then we can say that all things work together for good. Maybe not to my highest dreams in life, but all to my good. Better than I would have had had I not loved God first. Love for God is great because the love for God is the highest priority of human life. People refuse to obey God's other laws because they don't love him in the first place. If you can see someone arguing adamantly for some false practice or, or doctrine or belief, you can just write it down. That person doesn't really love God as he says he does. If he really loved God, he would listen to God's word and do what God says and teach what God says. If love for God isn't the first thing, then nothing else is really worth very much. Love, in our text this morning, is from the Greek verb agapao, which is a verb form of the, the word that probably is more familiar to, to you, and that would be agape. The verb form means to feel and to exhibit esteem and goodwill to a person, in this case to God. To prize and delight in a thing. How much of your time day by day is spent delighting in God? Feeling and exhibiting esteem and goodwill to God. At the very least, we ought to begin and end every day with that kind of focus. How can we expect to have a good day if we don't first connect ourselves to God in it and uh, determine to follow his path through life? Would that definition then define your thoughts about God and your thoughts about yourself? Can we say, well, I'll feel and exhibit esteem and goodwill today, it being Sunday, but I don't have to do that tomorrow? Is that true love for God? Is that the way you want your spouse or your parents or your children to think towards you? Love you today, but not tomorrow. <laughs> That's not what man expects of man. How can we think that God will tolerate or be pleased with that from man? How much is your service worth to the world? How far does your worship go toward God if it's all based upon our love for him? No love can be put before our love for God. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's a hard verse for some people to understand and deal with. But it needs to be seriously considered. Because everything else that we know about God makes him one that we want to follow, want to know, want to love. The, the, the word love here is translated from a different Greek word. It's translated from phileo, which is to approve of, to like, to treat affectionately or kindly to show signs of love. Now, we all do that in degrees to different people. We will, we will deal with some people maybe more kindly or affectionately than others. We will certainly approve of one more than another. We will show signs of love to one more than another. We all do that because we have different relationships with different people. We talk about loving your wife or your husband, loving your children or your parents, and then we talk about loving your neighbor. As yourself, well, my neighbor might be an old rascal. 
you know, and I love his soul. I love the fact that he's created by God and I want to see him in heaven, but I don't have the same thoughts for him that I do for my children and my grandchildren and my spouse. Probably not for myself. And so we have this attitude, this, this, this phileo love, this, <clears throat> this kind of, <clears throat> beg your pardon, this kind of approval or affection toward others in degrees. It shouldn't be a problem for us then to think in terms of loving God more than we love our parents. Does that mean we love our parents less than we could? Absolutely not. But it certainly means that God is higher than our parents and uh, we'll, uh, we'll put him first above all things. Sometimes we talk about obeying the laws of the land and we say, well, we, uh, we should obey the, the laws of the land unless they uh, conflict with the laws of God. Well, the same certainly could be said with regard to parents, couldn't it? We should always obey our parents because it's the right thing to do. But when we're old enough to make our own decisions, you know, and to, to be responsible for our decisions before God, if uh, parents say don't go that way and God says go that way, uh, then certainly we're going to put God first and follow him. That's only one small example of how we might love father, love uh, God more than a father or a mother. I was thinking of the famous poem that begins, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. If a newspaper reporter or a TV reporter were to follow you around for a day, could he count the ways that you love God? Would he be able to say, there's an example, there's an example, there's an indication, there's more evidence, this one loves God. If you yourself had to make a report on all the ways that you've shown your love for God in the last week, would you be able to do it? What would you have written this morning if one of our assignments as we come together was, okay, list all the ways that you demonstrated your love for God in the past week. What would be in that report? Maybe more important is what will be in that report next week because we can't do anything now about last week. How are we going to show our love for God in the days that he gives us in the immediate future? Remember what our brother John said, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, listen to him, the love of the Father is not in him. If the things of the world are more important to you than the things of God, then you don't love God. You might say that you do. You might feel something there. But the way God defines love, it isn't there. If the things of the world are what draws your attention. Love for God is the first and great commandment because love for God brings man the greatest blessings. You will never have a better life outside of the love of God than you can have when you put God first in your love. When our love leads us to offer our lives to God, as Paul did in that passage in the, uh, to the Galatian churches, when he said, I'm crucified in the world, but I live in Christ. When our love leads us to offer our lives to God, then God's love brings forgiveness for our sins. O Lord, <clears throat> the Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Psalm 145, <laughs> and verse number 20. That's a promise from God. It's not just a wish or a hope or a nice thought along the way. It's a promise from the Creator. He preserves all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Or the 37th Psalm, in the fourth verse that says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Why would we not love God and put him first in our lives? Love for God has certain requirements. Jesus outlines those requirements when he gives the dimensions of it here in our text in Matthew chapter 12. All of your heart, your soul, 
your mind and your strength. To love God with my mind might be described in terms of Paul's words to the Romans in, for, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To be conformed to something is to be shaped with or shaped like, to be made in the mold of the world. To be transformed is to be reshaped, to be shaped over into something else. Christians live in the world, but we're not of the world. John chapter 17, the prayer of Jesus. We're not to be shaped like the world. Don't let the world force you into its mold. You have to live in the world and be like the world, and you're always going to be a human being, and you're going to, you know, have all the, uh, the, the, the emotions and the relationships and everything else that goes along with being a human being. But you don't necessarily react to things or use the language that the world uses or the dress code that the world uses. Those things are governed by God when you put him first in your love. What could be done for God if in our minds, our thinking, our deciding, we truly love God first. What could be accomplished in this world? Love God with all your heart. Brother Batsel Baxter a few years ago told of, well many years ago now, told of seeing David or of hearing of David Lipscomb serving at the Lord's table and weeping at the thought of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. How much is the love of God in your heart? in the seat of your emotions, in that which causes you to feel and to react to things around you in the world. Here was a man of, of whom we think of his gospel preaching and his writing, the many good things that he did in the Lord's church. But when he served the Lord's table, he stood there weeping at the thought of the sacrifice of the Son of God. Love God with all of your soul, that is, with your whole life. In Psalm 23, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Or in the 25th Psalm, a psalm, a psalm that we like to sing. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Do you? Do you offer your whole soul to God? in your daily life in this world. Love God with your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength. That word strength is used, is translated in, in different ways. The word behind the word strength is translated in various ways in the scriptures. First Peter chapter 4, 11 has it this way, which might be a little bit more helpful to us. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him, let him do it as of the ability. And that's that same Greek word. Let him do it as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion and glory forever and ever. Praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When we serve God with all of our ability, given to us by our Creator, some of us may have more than others, maybe because of education, maybe because of health, Maybe because of, of relationships, associations, opportunities, whatever. But when we serve God with all of our ability, when we minister, serve with all of our ability, we're showing how strong is our love for God. When we go about a task, do we do it out begrudgingly? Or do we do it as uh, thankful to God that he has given us the ability and the opportunity to serve him here in whatever this might be. Love God with all your mind, your heart, your soul, and your strength. Love for God must be an obedient love. Man's greatest privilege is returning a part of God's love back to God. Remember, 
We love him because he first loved us. But we return that love to God by doing what God wants us to do. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, God's always going to love us. He's always going to want the best for us. But remember what we read in the Psalms, he preserves those who love him and destroys the wicked. Did you notice that those who love him are the opposite of the wicked or the people that are the opposite of those who love him? What does God call them? The wicked. There are two classes of people. There are those who love him and there are the wicked. And that's a rather uh, awesome thought. That's a thought arresting observation. We need to stop and think about how much do I love God? And what am I doing about the fact that he loves me? In the sixth verse of John's second general epistle, he said, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. How can you disobey what God said do and at the same time say, I love God? The Holy Spirit says that is inconsistent and illogical. God wants us first to know about Jesus. He gave us a book. He expects us to read it and get the facts and then to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, if you don't, you're going to die in your sins, John 8 and 24. He wants us to repent from our sins, to turn away from the desire and the will to live, like Paul, turning from fighting against the church to building up churches everywhere. That's called repentance. And then to confess our faith in Jesus and to be baptized into him. But the scripture also talks about walking in the light. What does that mean? Well, it means such things as what Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. The spirit or the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We could spend weeks and weeks just studying those words and see how they apply to our lives. But Paul says, if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. If you're a Christian, act like it. If you're a child of God, behave like one. Or what Peter wrote to us over in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To no, uh, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, of temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And then Peter said, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how everything hinges on my love for God? Do you understand why it's the first and great commandment. Everything depends upon my love for God. Peter wrote further in this passage, but he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see how everything depends upon my love for God? Do you have that entrance into an everlasting kingdom this morning? Do you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or do you need to repent, ask his forgiveness? Can we help you? Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you, for God's forgiveness and your strength and guidance in this life? That's what his children do. That's why we're here this morning. Won't you come to him while we stand and sing?